Hello, everyone, and welcome to Slash Film Daily for January 31st, 2018. On today's show, we'll be talking about a bunch of news, including Andy Serkis talking about the possibility of returning for Star Wars Episode Nine, how the Fantastic Beast sequel will address Dumbledore's sexuality, Cowboy Ninja Viking finds a new director, Paramount pledged Ology franchise, an unconventional Hocus Pocus sequel, and Bad Boys for Life gets two new directors, not just one, but two. Uh, this is Peter Sarada, and joining me on today's podcast is Slash Film senior writer Ben Pearson. Hey, what's going on? And Slash Film writers Huai Tran Bui. Hey, everyone. And Chris Evangelista. Hello. So let's, let's just jump into the, the news, uh, and let's start off with Fantastic Beasts. Um, we, we know that Dumbledore is gay uh, because J- author J.K. Rowling has told us that you know it, that much. It's not really revealed in the books or the movies. Uh, the new Fantastic Beast sequel will have Dumbledore, Dumbledore as a uh, in a younger capacity, and uh, the question is: Will the new Fantastic Beast sequel show Dumbledore's sexuality? No, is the answer. (laughs) Uh, David Yates, the director, he spoke to Entertainment Weekly, and he basically danced around the issue. He said, not explicitly. Uh, And he sort of pawned it off as saying, you know, the fans are aware of this, so if maybe if they read between the lines, they'll see, you know, uh, some sort of hint at Dumbledore's sexuality. But I don't know. I have a slight problem with this. Um you know, uh, representation matters, especially now more than ever, really. And it just seems weird that they would not want to address it. I mean, I get it. It's a big franchise, but that seems like all the more reason. I mean, that would be a big, bold step for a franchise to take to have, you know, an openly gay character like that. And, you know, I, it is worth saying that, you know, J.K. Rowling, she's writing the screenplay and maybe she has an overarching plan to eventually bring up Dumbledore's sexuality. But, you know, it's one thing to say it after the fact, but it's another thing to actually, you know, go through with it. So I, I hope it's sooner rather than later. But as for now, the sequel, the the crimes of Grindelwald, uh, Dumbledore's sexuality will not be addressed. Uh, you did mention a quote from J.K. Rowling from, I think, a couple years back. Am I, am it I was, correct? Yeah, it was two years ago at a press conference, and basically she said... As far as Dumbledore's sexuality is concerned, watch this space, which, you know, that can mean anything. It's not, you know, again, it is. Well, we've been watching this space for two years and we haven't seen anything. Um, Even longer than that. I mean, she announced Dumbledore was gay 10 years ago. So it's been a decade now. So they've had plenty of time in theory. I mean, I get, you know, they haven't making these movies for that time, but it just seems like, you know, if not now, then when is, is the question I ask. I, I I agree with you. If you're going to have a movie after the fact of you know announcing that he is gay uh, publicly, um, outing him on social media, uh, then you know why not have the the movie explore it in some extent, if if not just like you know uh, mentioning it. And, and uh, you know I I would like it more than a mention. I'm sure we've talked about this in the past, but um, uh, but um, I don't know. I, I, I have to be the devil's advocate here. Maybe she has a grand plan to have, you know, this come out in the the next couple Fantastic Beast movies because Dumbledore will theoretically play a character in all of them, right? Yes. Yes. Okay. Uh, (laughs) H.G., do you have any thoughts on this? Um, Well, my issue was mostly with David Yates' wording, uh, like what Chris said, but also there is a part where he talks about how Dumbledore and Grindelwald were in love with each other's ideas, which sounds like a major way of sidestepping their the a pivotal part of their relationship, which was that they did have a tumultuous relationship and had to do with philosophies, but also had to do with their own sort of romance with each other if you can call it that but it seems strange that in the first movie where we were see- seeing this um there these two characters come to a head for the first time on the big screen we're not going to have any mention of this past uh relationship that they've supposedly had we don't even know if they've had a relationship just that they've had some sort of feelings or emotions towards each other and that Dumbledore is is gay but we don't know if he's ever acted on it so for me, I don't mind. I don't mind if it's not like a pivotal, like if 
we don't see on screen Dumbledore like being having a gay having being a, a gay character being part of like his storyline. But I feel like a mention, like you said, is was really would be really important for me. Like, do do you guys think? Um, you know, I'm trying to think of like I'm trying to be, play devil's advocate here. Um, do you think that a big corporation like Warner Brothers is that they might not want? <laughs> to to feature that in this movie because you know it is a a kids movie, um, not that having a gay character in a kids movie is, is bad in any way um, or should be bad in any way, um, but uh, there is a big part of this country that I think might frown upon that, um, the more right uh, middle America part of this country I think um, do you think that it could be you know protecting the financial uh, profit of this franchise, Ben. Uh, I mean, that's a really cynical way of looking at it, but it it's definitely possible. Um, I mean, you know, just because of the, the, I mean, the fandom around the Harry Potter or the reaction to the Harry Potter franchise has already, like, even in its earlier earliest forms, um, has already. <laughs> I don't know if you guys remember, but people were like picketing the release of these books, you know, talking about how it it promoted witchcraft and all that stuff. So <laughs> you know that if the, the, that that uh, if Dumbledore was openly gay in this movie, that those same people would be back out, you know, protesting and making um, sort of you know uh, providing the movie with some negative press that I'm sure Warner Brothers would probably rather not have. But I think you know it, it's a it's a it's one thing to. Um, to play it safe, but you also have to, you know, like Chris was saying, representation is so important. At a certain point, you have to just um, realize that every decision you make is going to have detractors, and you have to look at the greater good in these situations. And in this case, that would be, you know, an entire generation of people feeling seen in a way that they hadn't in a big budget blockbuster before. So I think it's it's really important for them to get this right. And if they don't do it in this movie, I certainly hope that J.K. Rowling does have some plan to do it uh, sometime because it would be the biggest cop out in Harry Potter history if, you know, this Fantastic Beast franchise comes to a close and this is never, you know, uh, satisfactorily um, dealt with in any way. Yeah. Um, let's move on from uh, that form of witchcraft to another form of witchcraft. We have talked a lot about a Hocus Pocus sequel, which isn't really happening. They're kind of doing a reboot uh, on TV, I think. Uh, but now Hocus Pocus is actually getting a sequel, but in the form of a book. HD, what do we know? So a Hocus Pocus book is coming out on the film's 25th anniversary, and it will feature a fresh retelling of the classic Disney Halloween movie, as well as a sequel that takes place 25 years later with a new generation of teenagers living in Salem, including uh, Max and Allison, who were the characters from the first movie, uh, their daughter, Poppy. So it will tell this new generation of teenager stories and how they will come face to face with the um, book version of the witches from Hocus Pocus who were played by Bette Midler, Sarah Jessica Parker, and Kathy Najimy in the original film. So, yeah, unfortunately, we're not getting the feature film sequel that we've been kind of uh, demanding for the past couple years. And instead, we're getting a Disney Channel reboot with um, none of the original cast. But at least we'll have a semblance of a sequel in this book called Hocus Pocus and the all-new sequel, very on-the-nose title. I, I kind of wonder if this is a test in, in some way. If putting this uh, book out and seeing if it sells well is kind of a test uh, by Disney to see if there is an appetite for a Hocus Pocus sequel. Um, probably not, but um, it, it could be. Uh, uh, ben, do you think we will ever get a Hocus Pocus, Pocus sequel on the big screen? <laughs> <laughs> this is one of those where I feel like I sort of have to tap out because I haven't even seen the entirety of the original movie. Oh, and wow. <laughs> I know that uh, that it's much uh, much loved by a lot of people my age and HT's age and sort of right in our in our uh, generational wheelhouse, I guess. But um, for some reason, I just missed Hocus Pocus, that whole thing. I know, I know like I said, this, so many of my friends grew up loving this movie. But uh, yeah, I've never seen it. And I'm, you know, they've been talking about it for so long that I'm not sure if uh, the 
the sequel that everybody actually wants is ever going to actually <laughs> come to formulation. Chris, have you ever seen Hocus Pocus? Do you know anything about this? Oh, yes, I have seen Hocus Pocus. Um, it's fine. I mean, uh, <laughs> you know, it, when it came out, it was not a big hit. People didn't really care about it. It was only after, like, uh, home video, VHS back in the day. And also, I guess they rerun it on, like, the Family Channel every Halloween is where it started to pick up this sort of cult following. But it's not, a, you know, it's not a great movie, but it's also not – it doesn't have this really complex formula. It's a very simple story. So I feel like if they really wanted to, they could easily crack a sequel to this. But I don't know if the audience will be there for this because the audience wasn't there to begin with. It, so, you know, I, I feel like if they really want to do this, they should just do it like direct to VOD and just cut their losses or like Netflix, something like that. You know what it is? Not direct to VOD. The Disney is starting the streaming service. This would uh, be yeah. this would be mm-hmm. the perfect uh, venue. This would be the perfect um, place to to uh you know try to get the people that love this movie to subscribe with an original movie for the whatever it's going to be called the disney vaults or whatever um they should call it the disney vault that would be a great know, name for it i know the, the, like so many years I, do you remember that ht i'm not sure how old you are did you i'm 25 you, no well i know how old you are but like i'm not sure like was that a big thing from your childhood like because you know they would release movies and then they'd put them back in the vault so that you couldn't yeah, yeah. get those yeah you, you do remember that yeah, I do, because I remember they would be available on VHS for a short amount of time, and then you could not buy them again until they came out on DVD, for example. It was insa- an insane time. Now now that we're living in an age where you can get anything on your phone 24-7, I, I can't even think of that, that possibility of a, a studio doing that these days. Do you know what I mean? Like, it, what, what if Disney started doing that with the Marvel movies? Like, you know, <laughs> we're putting the Marvel movies in the... It. Yeah, people would freak. Uh, but yeah, let's move on. Uh, we've talked in the past about Mich- Mich- Michelle McLaren. Uh, she has directed episodes of Breaking Bad, uh, Game of Thrones, right? Yep. And uh, yeah, mm-hmm. and a lot of great uh, TV. And you know, she's been up for a lot of movies. And it seems like she might actually be making a big, uh, a, a big, big movie with Chris Pratt called Cowboy Ninja Viking. So, Chris, tell us about it. Yes, yeah, so Cowboy Ninja Viking has been in development for a very long time. Um, the the comic book it's based on was published in 2009, and in 2010 it got an option for a film. And 2014 it was announced that Chris Pratt was going to star, and then everything sort of died down since then. But now it looks like it's starting back up again. And uh, Michelle McLaren, who, as you mentioned, directed uh, Game of Thrones, she also has directed Breaking Bad and Better Call Saul, all that stuff, uh, is going to direct the film. Um, This is going to be her first uh, big, big screen film. For a while, she was going to direct Wonder Woman, and she walked away due to creative differences. And so now she has this, and she also has another movie in pre-production right now called The Nightingale. And both of these, The Nightingale and Cowboy Ninja Viking, are set for 2019. So I don't know if she's going to direct both of them for the one year or push one off or not. But as of now, she's officially attached to direct Cowboy Ninja Viking. Um, the, the story, the original story, says that Chris Pratt was one of the people who was pushing very hard to get a female director on this film. So that's part of the reason why she's here, but also just her talent is, you know, she's in very high demand. She's very acclaimed for her TV work. So now she's jumping to the big screen. So tell me who is excited for a movie called Cowboy Ninja Viking. Uh, (laughs) I, I can't help but think that uh, back when Chris Pratt first got attached to it, and that was before he became a really big name, thanks to Guardians of the Galaxy, that this is a movie that his character in Parks and Recreation, Andy Dwyer, would immediately jump to do. So it feels like not a real film, just because it's such a ridiculous title. I don't know anything else about it except for the title. Yeah, uh, um, Chris, so. what, what is the movie about? Well, the comic is is uh, it's about a scientist who uh, takes someone with multiple personality disorder and somehow turns those multiple personalities into individual people who are assassins and they all have distinct personalities. Like one is a cowboy, one is a ninja, one is a Viking. (laughs) So uh, it's a very, as you can tell, very medically accurate film. Um, So 
<laughs> so, 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 so Chris Pratt would be playing this triplet of characters. So he'd be playing multiple characters. There, it's not clear. Some reports say they want to cast three distinct leads, whereas in the comic, it's clearly the same guy as these three different people. So I don't know if it's they haven't decided yet if they want Chris Pratt to play all three or if they're going to cast two other leads for the film. Okay, now HT. Now that you've heard the synopsis for the film, do you want to see Cowboy Ninja Viking? Um, I'm kind of I'm curious. It sounds intriguing, but I feel like I would have been more inclined to see it actually uh, back when it was first announced uh, in 2014. Just because I feel like Chris Pratt's persona was more suited towards it. Now he's kind of trying to be a very serious action star, and um, I. I'm, would be, I would welcome him going back to his comedic persona and doing something with more range. But, yeah, I'm, I'm not sure. I, I, I am down for the ride, I guess I will say. Okay, next up in the news is Paramount has established a writer's room for the Ology franchise. What is the Ology franchise, Ben? Yes, so Paramount uh, is always looking for more blockbuster franchises, and they seem to be betting big on a, a series of ology movies, which is based on uh, a popular popular young adult series of books. Uh, there are 13 books so far, and these books have sold 18 million copies worldwide. They are essentially um, encyclopedias of different topics. So uh, some of the book titles are called Monsterology, Vampireology, Alienology, um, Spyology, and they all have uh, individual stories. I'll, I'll read you the synopsis really quickly of one called Oceanology. Um, what if a 16-year-old assistant traveled aboard the storied Nautilus, the narwhal-shaped submarine of 20,000 leagues under the sea? And what if he were the sole survivor of the ill-fated voyage and went on to relay his adventures to a certain Jules Verne? Find this brave young man's own account in the lavishly illustrated Oceanology, a tale of the 1866 voyage of discovery that investigates diving bells and shipwrecks, coral reefs, ice canyons, Sharks, giant octopi, and luminous sea monsters, uh, underwater volcanoes, and even the legendary island of Atlantis. So it's more of like a um, a fictional uh, encyclopedia. It doesn't necessarily have like a um, a full story, but there are there do appear to be some narrative threads throughout. And uh, Paramount is looking to capitalize on this and turn this into a multi-film franchise. Uh, but you guys might already have guessed this, uh, Akiva Goldsman, yay, the award, the uh, Oscar winning writer of A Beautiful oh. Mind, but, but the, uh, the writer producer of, uh, Batman Robin, Insurgent, Rings, and The Dark Tower is the one who is sort of spearheading this movement, uh, at Paramount to get this up and running. So he has started and, and you know, formulated this writer's room that includes, um, some really talented people, Joe Robert Cole, who co-wrote Black Panther, Lindsay Beer, who's writing uh, King Killer Chronicle, Jeff Pigner, who wrote, uh, Jumanji, Welcome to the Jungle, Nicole Perlman, who wrote Captain Marvel. Christina Hodson, who wrote Bumblebee, and Michael Chabon, who wrote uh, John Carter, they are in uh, a writer's room trying to come up, you know, the the hope right now is that each writer will come up with a take on one of these books and create a treatment for it before eventually writing the screenplay, and then uh, they'll end up with seven movies that have interconnected stories. Um, we know that Akiva Goldsman is supposed to be writing one of the scripts himself, so... I mean, honestly, it's like I was OK with all of this, you know, Paramount wanting a new live action, family friendly franchise until I heard Akiva, Akiva Goldsman's name. And that immediately sucks all of the air out of this for me. I don't know if anybody else uh, has any hope for this thing, but um, the concept kind of sounds like it, you know, it's it's uh, broad enough for them to be able to put their own stamp on it and do something interesting with it. But I just don't have any confidence that this is going to turn out uh, to be any good if Goldsmith's name is on it. Akiva's Gold Goldsmith is not confidence inducing at all, probably the opposite. But uh, I mean, I do love the idea that they're trying to come up with this franchise, uh, you know, together in a room. You know, it's the opposite of what they're doing with Star Wars, where they're, you know, trying to plan the whole thing at once. And um, I don't know. I, I would love to actually see a movie franchise that. I don't even think Marvel does this great where it actually feels like 
the whole thing's kind of planned out and the interconnectivity feels like meticulously like plotted if that makes sense like almost like pulp fiction or something yeah and akiva goldman's goldsman was the guy who started the transformers cinematic universe uh writer's room so i Uh, guess we'll see if you know maybe basically a lot of the same people were involved in the same process uh, you know, they're going through the same process, basically. So I, th- I think if Bumblebee feels, you know, connected in some way to Transformers The Last Night, for example, maybe that'll be a, a little bit of a, a nod toward what you're hoping this could this could turn into. Um, it I, seems like I, there I, is I don't, a... <laughs> I, I don't, I don't want another Transformers The Last Night. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, uh, I don't know. Do you think, does anybody else think that this has a chance of being good? It's a it's a neat concept, but yeah, Akiva Goldsmith or Goldsman. What is his name? Goldsmith or Goldsman? Uh, Goldsman. Yeah, I think I, okay. I mispronounced his name. I points. always remember it wrong too. Yeah. But anyway, he stinks, so I don't <laughs> I don't really want him involved with big franchises. But apparently, he must be very good at convincing people he can do this sort of thing. So <laughs> who knows? There's a lot of writers and producers in Hollywood that are very good in the room, and uh, you know maybe n- the quality of the f- the films that they're on don't turn out to be too good. HD, what are your thoughts? Yeah, um, I don't have a lot of confidence in Akiva Goldsman either, and this whole story sort of reeks of trying to put the cart before the horse, like Universal did with the Dark Universe, and trying to build a cinematic universe or a franchise before a story itself is in place. Although the talent behind the scenes, other than Goldsman, is is talented. Is just, yeah, I don't. I'm not very sure about it. Okay, let's move on from that to the Bad Boys sequel, which I I don't believe is ever going to happen, but um, (laughs) we'll see. Bad Boys for Life gets uh, two new directors, HD. Tell us about it. So Bad Boys for Life, the third Bad Boys film, is finally moving forward. I'm going to be optimistic about this because Sony is negotiating with a directing duo, Adil LRB and Bilal Falah. I'm sorry if I mispronounced those names, uh, who are a Moroccan-born directing duo, uh, live in Belgium, and uh, directed the Juliet, Romeo they, and Juliet-inspired crime drama Black. They, they, they had to go all the way to Belgium to find someone to direct this movie. <laughs> so, yeah, essentially. Um, and uh, this movie is reportedly moving forward uh, with Jerry Bruckheimer set to produce, and Will Smith and Martin Lawrence supposedly Uh, coming back for the roles which they originated in the first Bad Boys. Um, But they haven't confirmed anything yet except for the directors and the fact that this script is written by uh, uh, the Wedding Ringer producer Chris Bremner, this latest draft of the script anyways. We'll see if this script sticks sticks through. Uh, So this is the first of two Bad Boys projects that are currently in development and the other Bad Boys... um, spinoff actually seems to be more concrete. It's uh, the Bad Boys TV spinoff featuring Gabrielle Union uh, reprising her role from Bad Boys 2. So this is a female-driven uh, detective show about Sid Burnett, who's Gabrielle Un- Union's character, who was an undercover DEA special agent and uh, Martin Lawrence's character's sister uh, in the films. And she uh, partners with a new detective at LPD, LAPD and um, is basically a, a nice dramatic procedural and now they recently cast Ghostbusters star Ernie Hudson as her father in the series. So that one is going to NBC at some point um, and that feels like a little bit more concrete rather than Bad Boys for Life which has been sort of spinning its wheels for the past couple years with Jerry Bruckheimer very intent on making this movie happen. Yeah, I remember our own Brad Oman was on the set of Transformers the last night and they were talking at that, that point Joe Carnahan was attached to direct Bad Boys for Life and they mentioned it to uh, Michael Bay and asked him about it and Michael Bay laughed it off like that movie will never happen. So um, if Michael Bay believes it's never going to happen, I don't know. (laughs) Uh, But let's move on to our last and final story. And this story will contain spoilers for Star Wars The Last Jedi. So if you were the only person on Earth who has not seen Star Wars Episode Eight, uh, you know, you might want to turn off now. But uh, Ben, our own uh, Ben Pearson, talked to Andy Serkis uh, about the possibility of Snoke's return in Star Wars Episode Nine. Ben, what did he say? 
Yeah, so yesterday I spoke with Andy Serkis at the Junket for Marvel's Black Panther. Um, I'm going to have a full interview with him coming up pretty soon. But uh, I had to throw in one little Star Wars question, and uh, I recorded the whole thing, so you guys can listen to it right now. So I'd like to ask you a very quick Star Wars question before I get <laughs> back to uh, to Marvel stuff. Um, I know that Supreme Leader Snoke was sort of seemingly set up as like this ultimate galactic villain in The Force Awakens, so I'm just curious what your reaction was the first time you read the script for The Last Jedi and realized that he's going to die in that way. Um, I, I, I think, look, it's Star Wars, so you never know how life, you know, or whether life can be come back to or not, you know, whether, whether, whether you can be resuscitated or brought back. You know. uh, but it, no, I was shocked. I was, I was shocked. Um, but it felt, I mean, it feels dramatically, it felt absolutely right for that moment in the film. So mm. I didn't question it. You know, I just, uh, I just think it's, uh, you know, it, it's, it, it, it's a very, very important scene. Mm-hmm. And, um, so I didn't, I didn't question it, but I do, but, um, I know it's left fans feeling like you know there's there's that they were really searching for something there and 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 what I'm saying is who knows. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Have you spoken with JJ at all about potentially coming back? I'm, I'm not so spoken to him okay. about it. So that definitively says that Snoke is going to be returned in J.J. Abrams' Star Wars Episode Nine, right? <laughs> no, not quite. And I actually, I followed up and asked him if he had spoken with Abrams yet, uh, and he said that he had not gone gone that far. He's not actually talked to him about, uh, you know, officially coming back in any capacity. But uh, I just thought it was interesting that I just asked him about, you know, his reaction to Snoke's death, and that that seemed to be something that he brought up like almost unprompted, you know. Um, so, do you guys think there's any way that Snoke coming back in Episode Nine would actually make sense? Not not should he come back because I don't think he should because it would probably undercut uh, the dramatic impact of the Last Jedi, and I think all of us would probably agree on that. Um, but do you guys think that there is a way in the world of Star Wars for J.J. Abrams and who is co-writing episode nine with him, Chris Terrio, I think, yeah. um, for them to be able to come up with a way, a, a satisfying way for Snoke to return in episode nine. Well, um, if you do get the Star Wars, The Last Jedi visual dictionary, um, there is some interesting stuff in there. I know, I know this is created by Pablo Hidalgo of the uh, Star Wars story group. And it kind of, um, I think here's the line. I'll get the line for you. It, and it says, uh, though his name is known to the galaxy and his reputation of supreme leader to the First Order precedes him, few have ever seen Snoke in the flesh. His, he obscures himself with distance, being forever unreachable, save for a select few who can contact him directly. Even under such circumstances, Snoke disguises his true nature. Whatever frailties have broken his body are dwarfed by the immense size of which he is typically projects his form. Now, some people have read that to be that, like, you know, he could be force projecting himself as some into that. Like, he's actually not there. But I, I'm not sure you could also read that as when he projects himself as a hologram, he projects himself huge, kind of like we see him in Force Awakens. Um, mm-hmm. do, do you do you think there's any... I mean, it seems to me Ryan Johnson was very dead set on Snoke being dead. Like, you know, they made a maquette that they actually shot. Um, and, you know, they show close up that he is kind of, you know, not just dead, but uh, in pieces. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, I, I don't think there's any way. I mean, I, I sort of speculated in my piece that I, I wondered if there's any way that he was so powerful in the for, in the ways of the Force that he was not just astral projecting like we saw Luke do, but maybe he was able to project a physical version of himself into that room. I, I don't know if that's even possible in the Star Wars universe. And I think even if it is for them to be able to bring him back and then explain a way, you know, explain that that is how things work just seems really inelegant to me so they would basically have to bring episode nine to a screeching halt and like explain the physics and the rules of the world for a second um and it just seems like something they they wouldn't really do but i don't know hc do you think uh that there is a way that he could come back and do you agree that maybe he probably shouldn't i don't know my what do you think 
I'm sure there's some far-fetched way to bring him back, but I don't think it would be a way that's very believable or compelling. Basically what you're saying, Ben, and no, I do not agree that he should be brought back. I Does that make sense? Yeah, he should not be brought back, essentially. <laughs> uh, he, I, I do agree, it would undercut the dramatic tension of Episode Nine and also Kylo Ren's ascension to one of the great Star Wars villains. So I, I think that um, Andy Serkis may be reacting to uh, maybe the fan outrage. Uh, even he, as a distinguished actor who probably is not on social media, probably has heard of the outcry against Star Wars The Last Jedi at some point. And it was, I will say, the one thing I do regret about Snoke in The Last Jedi is that it wasted Andy Serkis, who is a very talented actor. And I wish I could have seen more of him in the Star Wars universe. Maybe not a Snoke, but I would be happy to see him again. Uh, doing his thing mm -hmm. yeah and uh, screen uh crush also talked to andy circus at the junket and kind of asked him about the mystery of snoke's backstory and you know he did say they you know they have discussed it and uh quote uh, we wanted to keep it a mystery and you know by the way it is a star it is star wars so who knows what might happen without giving anything away which seems kind of ominous and uh, teasery. Um, but I don't know. Maybe, maybe they could end up showing a little bit of backstory. I feel like we still need to, at some point, learn who the Knights of Ren are. And he's a, <laughs> he's, he's a big part of that. So maybe in J.J. Abrams' movie, we will find out about that. Or maybe, maybe there could be a you know, Star Wars standalone movie in the future called Star Wars. Or, or Knight, the Knights of Ren, a Star Wars story. Yeah, and I guess after The Last Jedi established flashbacks, um, we could theoretically see uh, Snoke return in a, in flashback form, just not necessarily resuscitated or, or brought back after he was, you know, bisected in, in The Last Jedi. That's another question. Uh, someone, I, I forget who, asked on Twitter that, are, are do Siths become, um, not that he is a Sith, but... I mean, he's a force user. Does he become a force ghost? Oh, interesting. That's a good question. Oh, so Is that like something because I uh, think I think, and I, I'm certainly not even close to as big of a Star Wars fan as you are, Peter. So you probably know the answer to this. But I think Qui Gon Jinn was supposed to be the first person that really like perfected the force ghosting technique. Is that right? I believe so. I'm not. I'm not. My my knowledge of Star Wars is more in the original trilogy and not in the prequel trilogy. Mm -hmm. uh, but I I don't think I don't believe we've seen a Sith as a Force ghost other than like Anakin Skywalker, but he was redeemed right um, in Return of the Jedi. Um, and uh, I wonder if if you did have a Sith Force ghost, would he be red instead of blue? Interesting. <laughs> See, that is actually a really interesting prospect because if Snoke does come back as a Force ghost, that is actually one way that I would sort of welcome him returning because he could be sort of like the devil on the shoulder of Kylo Ren. Yeah, yeah, he that could be haunting be... him in the same yeah. way that, that Luke might be because um, we, we all suspect that Luke is going to come back in some capacity and it would probably be you know maybe as a Force ghost to haunt Kylo Ren in some way. So that would be kind of cool to see. He uh snoke and luke you know sort of on each side of his shoulder the de devil yeah. and the angel <laughs> you, you know what uh not to get into more complaining about last jedi but i i need to bring this up <laughs> because i have not brought this up on any of the podcasts i've talked about last jedi uh about but uh, at one point in last jedi yoda I, I i believe physically uses lightning to destroy the jedi tree right yeah he does uh, yeah. yeah he calls it down i think yeah doesn't that sound a set of a dangerous precedent that you know force ghosts can control reality <laughs> in this world um, i mean i guess um yeah. that's a good question actually yeah. okay so peter I'll, i'm gonna explain it away like this okay uh maybe yoda as a force ghost is more in tune is so in tune with the force that he understands weather patterns uh, right before <laughs> they happen. And I think it was raining uh, at that moment when when Luke was about to uh, to go in and destroy that tree, or maybe it was maybe it was just about to rain, and Yoda was just raising his arms in <laughs> celebration at at the lightning bolt that he knew that was about to arrive anyway, and not actually calling it down himself. I don't yeah, know. Maybe it was a faded lightning bolt, something. <laughs> of a mythological event and not something that was actually controlled 
by Yoda yeah. Force Ghost. I, I don't know if I buy this one, guys. Uh, <laughs> I, you know, I don't think I have a huge problem with this. This isn't like you know a big, uh, you know, th- thing of co- you know big complaint. But I wonder if that does open up the future of you know Force Ghost actually, you know, having a physical presence, you know, a more than physical presence in the Star Wars galaxy. But I don't know. Anyways, we're, we're going along. Ben, where can we find more of your work online? Uh, you can find me on Twitter at Ben Pears, and I'm writing every day at SlashFilm.com. HT, where can we find you? You can find my writing at SlashFilm.com, and, I, and I'm on Twitter at HTranBooey. Uh, you can find more about all these stories we mentioned on today's show at SlashFilm.com. SlashFilm Daily is published every weekday, bringing you the most exciting news from the world of movies, television, from SlashFilm.com. You can subscribe to Slash Home Daily on iTunes, Google Play, Overcast, all the popular podcast apps. Uh, please feel free to send us your feedback, questions, comments, concerns to peter at slashfilm.com. And uh, please go rate and review us on iTunes. Spread the word, tell your friends, and we will see you tomorrow. <laughs>